Um, thank you so much for having me, first of all. And I'm gonna go real fast and jump right into it because there's a lot to go over. I'm gonna show you some images first. Maybe these are not yet the pictures you expect. Um, this is a comic artist that I like a lot. She mostly creates comics about her experiences and it's funny because I've often wondered, like, is she my long lost twin or something? Because <laughs> I don't know how you guys see me, of course, but this, the second image is down there. Yeah, kind of smelly golem. That's what it looks like. <laughs> my partner's here in the audience. He will probably nod along. Yep, she, it's like that. She doesn't see people for days at a time. <laughs> how about this one? <laughs> yeah, feeling that. <laughs> Wish me luck, guys. <laughs> And this, um, this is how we do the art. This is it, this is the whole talk, you can go home. <laughs> um, so why, why did I just show you guys a bunch of comics? Uh, it's not a comedia, you know, comedy conference. Um, I didn't even know if you guys would laugh. I had to take the chance that I'd be up here by myself laughing. <laughs> and the reason is that we, as artists, as creators, publishers, journalists, writers, whatever we do, we are always thinking about other people. We're always thinking about how can we create images for others? How will they perceive it? Will they like it? Will they understand it? How can we best structure this information for others? And we're always kind of practicing this empathy, or at least we should be. But what I wanna talk about is the other side of that coin, which is maybe gonna sound blasphemous. Um, I'm not sure, maybe gonna sound contradictory, um, but it's really important to also in all this, not forget yourself. Because you have to remember to create for yourself as well because something brought you to this, right? Something excited you. Or maybe you thought something was missing. For some reason you wanted to add your voice to this choir. So I'll talk more about that, but first, what makes something funny? It's pattern breaking. And of course, gross oversimplification because I'm not a comedian, I don't have that much time. Uh, but by that I mean, first of all, for a pattern to be recognized by somebody, it has to be true. It has to be something they experienced, they saw before. And the break is when we veer away from that in an unexpected way. So we do this in comedy, yes, but we also do it in art all the time. We take symbols, stories, ideas that people are familiar with, and then we break them. We break those rules because that's where the intrigue lies. If you just put down a pattern then what do you have? Something that people know, it's maybe kind of mundane and possibly not interesting. So I wanna talk about more of the, the truth portion of that, the pattern. And I like this quote a lot, I come back to it, I've remembered it over the years. Um, in the particular is contained the universal. What Joyce means by this is when you share something about yourself or that is true to yourself, that's deeply true, embarrassingly true, because we're all human and we have similar experiences, there's a very good chance that other people will also see that truth, that they will relate to you. And that will have a much greater impact than if you choose the safe thing, if you, you know, talk about the weather. And I don't suggest doing this in, you know, daily conversation, but this is what we do when we take the position of artist. We sort of agree to do this. Here's another way to say that. Um, so science provides an understanding of a universal experience. Arts provide a universal understanding of a personal experience. So having said that, let me tell you my personal experience. I was a kid in school who hated math. And again, I know this is a science conference, but math is inextricable. And I kind of, you know, I, I wasn't, impressed or I didn't, I didn't wanna do um, like 10 form polynomials to figure out how many socks Susie had. I just didn't care. <laughs> and there were all these posters on the walls that were like, you need math for your job and your life will be terrible without it. And they did this in like, you know, kind of witty ways. And I didn't believe that either because even in high school, I, I had already been working as a designer and kind of, Whatever, I don't know, I didn't <laughs> pay attention to that. Um, but you know, what did happen is that I was reading things that led me to ask questions. And those were 
pretty deep questions, and the things I was reading didn't have answers, and so it led me to these other things, these people. And they sometimes had answers, but what was even better is they willingly admitted when they did not, that they were there for the journey. They wanted to find out, that they were also curious, and they didn't know everything. And <laughs> I loved this. I, I was so enamored by all of these things because Carl up there, he didn't tell me you need a job or you need math for your job, you need science for your job. He told me that the world was demon haunted and <laughs> here's a candle. And I gladly took that candle. I was like, thank you. And he told me I was made of star stuff. And so what happened, I, I was reading all of these things. And when you read this stuff, you start to think that you understand. But they're such good communicators, and they lead you to believe that. But you don't. And I, I realized that I didn't quite. And that I, if I wanted to incorporate these ideas into my life and my work in any meaningful way, that I had to get a better foundation. And the other thing it led me to realize was that math was part of this and that it was the language of nature. And in all of this, I realized that these things were so incredibly important because of the way these people talked about them. And they became more important to me than almost anything else. I didn't care if I could be an artist, if I couldn't be involved in this. And so I was like graduating art school, I um, was working full time in advertising and I decided that I would take night courses and I started to do every online course I could take, intro physics, um, I did like a comp sci course, math, whatever. And then I even went across the park to City College and I took some introductory courses there to physics and biology and calculus. So like, that's hilarious to me now. They got me hook, line, and sinker. Oops, I'm doing math for some reason again, even though I swore it off. <laughs> um, and what else happened during this time is I saw this magazine. And somebody sent this to me, a friend who knew that I was interested in this kind of stuff. And when I first got here, I realized that mm, I, w I wasn't quite sure what it was, if it was like a blog or something. It didn't look super official. But I did a little bit of digging, and I realized, no, these are legit journalists who are really good at their jobs, and they're supported by this foundation. This is a very legit thing. And they were constantly putting out quality just super accurate writing about science and math, and I was so impressed, and I became a huge fan of this place. So when they put out a job notice in 2014 that they needed an art director, I was like, that's me. I can do that. Let me in here. <laughs> and luckily they did. They agreed that I was the right person for this, and so I'm still there. Uh, and it doesn't look like that anymore. We did a big redesign that brought a lot more people to it. And I've been doing all kinds of stuff. I've been looking after the general design of the magazine and website. And um, you know, I've been making these illustrations, animations, 3D stuff, occasional infographics. And maybe my favorite part is actually working with other artists. So these are people who I'm a huge fan of. And I'm just so grateful to them for saying yes to me, to, to us, to doing this, and to consistently creating these wonderful images for us. And when we, when we deal with this kind of content, <coughs> Quanta deals with stuff that is basic research. So it's at the forefront of mathematical and scientific research. It's super heady stuff. It's not the kind of thing that people you know, just normally <laughs> bump into. And when we deal with that kind of stuff, which I'm sure many of you in this room do, um, it's so high up there and we're tempted to bring it down to earth. And I wanna say, don't do that. Leave it up in the sky. Instead, build space elevators, build rockets, open portals, because people want to go on this adventure. They wanna go. So can anybody finish that title quote? Just yell it out. Well, it's indistinguishable from magic. It's Arthur C. Clarke. So all of this stuff, um, I'm telling you, don't just you know say, oh, well, Iron Man's cool. I'm going to put him on the thing, and kids will like that. That's not quite the point. Uh, the idea is to take these things apart, figure out why these stories work, why these images work, and use that. If you've ever heard the term steal like an artist, that's what it means. We look at all these things. We take them apart like an engineer might. and we use that in our problem solving. 
So um, this is a good example of this working well, in a way. Um, NASA, they started uploading all of these images over the past few decades, and increasingly they got more and more high res, and people really loved these. I love these, I like when we can use these in articles. And that was kind of the best part, not just that they were wonderful and exciting and so, it was just incredible to see, you know, these photons from billions of light years away, but that they allowed people to use them just with a credit, and people did use them. And I think, <laughs> I think this is wonderful. These were so in the public conscience, and people were so excited by these that we wanted to wear these images of our universe on our legs. That's incredible. Like that was, you know, maybe the only time in history that we could do this, that we had sufficient technology for this. And the real reason that I'm sharing this example is people will absolutely roll their eyes and scoff at galaxy leggings, at Carl Sagan, all the rest of it, and they'll say, that's not real science, though. You don't really like science. You like it because it's shiny. It's just pop sci. Okay, well, you know what? It's a big gate, and don't be a gatekeeper. The gate has multiple doors, and you don't know where people might be coming from. People have all kinds of experiences, all kinds of abilities. And, you know, whatever, if you see them coming through the East Gate, don't run over there and try to close it. God, let them in. Be welcoming. Be kind. Somebody might see those leggings, a boy or a girl, and they might think, what is that? How did they make that image? And then, like me, they might find themselves doing math for some reason. <laughs> so... And the thing is, um, as wonderful as those images are, we know they don't just come out of the telescope or camera that way. It's a lot of work. Um, but they are charismatic, and a lot of us have to deal with stuff that's less charismatic. Um, genes, AI, algorithms, like how many times have I done robots and ones and zeros? And it's tough. What do we do with these? And what, what we do, what we need. It's kind of the opposite of what Harry had. We need a visibility cloak. And all of these things that I've been talking about, the pattern breaking, the empathy, all of that, that's all things that you weave in. These ideas are ideas that you weave into your cloak. So a few more ideas. I've been talking a lot about magic, all of that, but we have to be careful. Even I, like at Quanta, the quality is at such a high quality and the, the facts and the accuracy are there, and you need the structure, but even so, you have to take great care because it could get lumped in or reappropriated to be part of something that's not accurate, that's not scientific. So be careful. Second of all, this is not just about making pretty pictures. Again, it's about weaving all of these ideas together of different disciplines. And finally, The artist is not just a pair of hands. They have a myriad of experiences that can help problem solve. But to do so, the artist needs good data, rich data, because our images, whatever we create, it can only be as good as the information that we have. So if somebody's telling you, this is all you need to know, just do this, say, no, I need more. I would like to see the papers. As much as you can get through, get through that and learn it, okay? So all of those things are what, take, what it takes to make images like this, right? It's not just, a, you're not gonna get away with a Photoshop course and do this. Um, this is one of the first earliest things that I kind of made for Quanta, and for some reason they let me do this, and I think they were nervous, but we did. And I said, I'm gonna make this witch circle, and I'm gonna put the Tracy Widom distribution in the middle, and it's gonna be connected to all of these different things that it's related to. And this is, this is pattern breaking. This is two different patterns, right? We've got the scientific, the mathematical, the accuracy. It's there. But then I also put in magic. And I did that because for a lot of people, they get stuck with Susie and her socks and not caring. And they don't get to see math as magical. They don't get to see this, and I want them to. Here's another one. This is a quantum computer. It's... What is a quantum computer? It's something that has to be kept cold. It's a fragile system. It's full of errors and noise, but potentially something extremely powerful. And we did that. We created this character. A wonderful artist created this for us 
because the gold thing over there on the right, that's an actual quantum computer, and that is not in anybody's mind who thinks of a computer. That, that's not what it looks like. They don't know what that is. It's pretty, but it doesn't mean anything. It doesn't say anything. So we created this other, this character, these symbols, these patterns, and we broke them. And then we put it in these other stories. This was for a series, so it became part of a neural network, and it became part of the race for supremacy, the never-ending race. And here is another image. We kind of started with the sketch over there. And the, the sketch is fine, it's from Wikipedia, but it's something that a researcher would look at. It says that it's not for you. You probably don't understand what this is. And this is <laughs> super heady physics that people are working on right now. And it's super interesting, but it's not going to be interesting for a lot of people because they see that and they think that's not for me. And so what we did instead is, again, not just make it pretty, but make it something that people will maybe see and be interested in, maybe think, oh, what is that? It looks like kind of a magical object, or maybe this is something important that you should care about. And a uh, final image, this is Cole Fury. She is a mathematical physicist. And I didn't do a whole lot here. A photographer took that wonderful image for us. And I kind of just photoshopped that symbol behind her because it's the Fano plane. It's a kind of math that she works with. And Cole herself loved this image and it got a really good reception. And I love this image for other reasons. I like it because if you showed people this about, I don't know, a few hundred years ago, they would have tried to hang her as a witch, right? <laughs> Glad we're not doing that anymore. Um, so that's it. That's all I have for you today. And I hope that you're inspired to, again, build space elevators.